my presentation tonight is um, partly an, an introduction to our area. Also, I am the director of the Alpine Institute here, which uh, the purpose of the Alpine Institute is basically connecting students to this area. So it's a combination of outdoor activities, there's the Alpine Club, and we do trips and mountaineering activities and that sort of thing. But it's also the citizen science um, projects here, which are a um, big part of them is just getting the kids outside. Because almost everybody who comes to this school has come from an urban environment, and they're used to flat, concrete-covered spaces. And they are now in a place that's not that at all. And they could easily go through a little bubble where... All they do is take the taxi between our different buildings, um, which is regrettable, but a lot of them do that. Um, or some walking around, but not really connecting with the, the local environment that's incredibly special. And so that's part of what, what our um, citizen science research here is just connecting the students with being outdoors. But I want to um, welcome Christoph Ott, is the grandson of the founder of the school here. And he just come to to welcome you and to learn a bit more about this also. So um, welcome, Christoph. If you could just say it. Oh, greetings. So it's not a big audience, but I think for the camera in the back, this is more useful. So um, so thanks for the introduction, John. My name is uh, Christoph Ott, and uh, I, I represent the third generation of the founding family, and I lead the school together with my brother. And I think. Um, it's been incredibly inspirational to see what, what John and Dan and a bunch of other people, including Paul, uh, have been doing at the school in terms of um, inspiring uh, and creating uh, vocations. I, I'm, I myself come out of engineering, and believe me, I would have benefited immensely from the kind of things that you're doing in citizen science, because I arrived in engineering and I was clueless. I sort of chose it practically throwing a dart um, uh, <laughs> on a wall, um, and uh, and I think the kind of reality-inspired and experiential learning that the students are able to uh, uh, live through with the let study is tremendous. It's tremendously hard because the rigor required by, for them to be successful in uh, presenting their data is tremendous too. But the kind of learning experience that they get out of is, is, is gigantic, and this is something that. Um, I know my grandmother who um, passed away last year. She was uh, almost 101 years old. And uh, she still spoke in front of the whole school a few months before her passing. And she was observing with great pride what she, her you know, and her husband's initial impulse have become. And this is one of the big pieces that makes her especially proud of because it's not just education. You know, not every classroom has walls. Sometimes a classroom can have a mountain or be on a mountain. And, um, this is a perfect example of what we're doing. So we're immensely happy and proud to have you all here. I hear you're from anywhere from 15 to 20 countries. So you've flown from all over the place. Thanks for coming on to the, the Magic Mountain, which is what Lesa is called affectionately. Um, and uh, tomorrow we will have another four schools coming. Two of them got scared away by the weather, supposedly. Uh, and had to cancel last minute, it's a bit too bad, but uh, it's, it's a movement that is growing, it's a movement that we want to continue to push uh, and pioneer, and we have some great pioneers among ourselves who will tell you what we've been doing and continue to push that, push that envelope between learning and reality and doing that in a meaningful way. So, thank you very much all for coming. grandmother, um, when they founded the school in 61, or 6061, they actually opened the doors in 61, and then it was her operation, I don't think it was her personally, but they hired my parents to teach here, and so I moved here when I was seven years old, and um, thought I'd move to heaven, and then um, dad died on a local mountain when I was 10, and so we moved back to the States, and I didn't think I would ever leave Les and then by the way fates worked, here I am back again, full circle, thanks to the arts, and I'm very pleased for that. And very, just as much in love with the mountain environment around here now as I was when I was young. So let me get the, turn off the lights here. Yeah, I was hired to 
do citizen science here actually through the GLOBE program was initial idea. So, and the outdoor education. So when we, when I came here, I was discussing with Dan, another um, science teacher, what, what should we do? What would be the interesting thing to, to study with the students here? And we realized that here we are in Les uh, We're on the side of a mountain. There's a valley down below, which is about 450 meters. And then it goes up to about 2,300 meters on the peak here. So the interesting thing to study would be what's different from the lower part to the upper part and how does that change and it's climate um, that sets the differences and so it's climate change that's going to influence the differences in the future. So uh, by embedding a study, if we came up with an interesting study to do here and we really embed it in the school, then the school is going to be here long after any of us, except the Ott family, um, <laughs> will be here. And, <clears throat> So this it becomes a longitudinal study, and a good climate research study should be 30 years long at least, and, and you know, it should just go on indefinitely. So here we have a chance by embedding a study like this into the school to create something that's really long-term, that's good for the students every year as they go through the program, uh, or every four years hopefully, or even six years now that we have started with seventh grade, then uh, they go through this cycle, but it's the accumulated information over time, the data that we gather over time, that's going to make it really interesting. And that we can do just because we're part of the, an institution that's going to be longer than we are. Um, so that's what we decided to do. And a student under um, Tom Paddock, uh, back here, he has started a film club and a student is doing a service project for his IB CAS, and he put together a little film, a four-minute film, about the LET study that I'm going to show you now. This is the world premiere. It was just finished yesterday. Um, it's not finished by our teacher's definition, so we're going to do some refinement, but did a pretty darn good job. So this will be the start of my talk. Hi, I'm John Harlan. I'm the director of the Alpine Institute at LAS. And I'm Dan Patton. I'm a science teacher. We started the LET study together about three years ago. And the LET stands for the Local Elevation Transect Study. And this is a study that Lausanne American School students are doing in their science classes. We're collecting biodiversity data, which means all the different types of plants and animals that are on these plots. And we're measuring trees in order to see how much they're growing over time and we're doing some soil studies and decomposition, so a number of things. We have forest all around us. Um, all we have to do is walk out the front door of our school building and within a couple of minutes we can be in a forest setting. You do have to do tree mapping. You have to do um, baby trees, temperature, photography. What I'm doing is I'm marking down which trees are which. So if it's a conifer or a type of tree it is and putting it on this grid. We have to plot down which tree is where and then we have to prove it to the other scientists. Well, I'm measuring the circumference of the trees. I think it's mainly to see um, how fast the trees are growing and to help the scientists with whatever investigation they are having right now. Imagine the, the, the Amazon jungle. There's not many conifer trees, are there? But did all the conifer trees die? Oh, no, they're best suited to some. What kind of places are they generally best suited to the conifers? Oh, oh. Colder places, harsher places, drier places. The Lausanne is amazing because we're right here on the side of a mountain. And so our campus elevation is about 1,400 meters, but the valley is about 500 meters. And we go up to the mountain behind us at 2,300 meters. And so you can see all these different changes that happen as the altitude goes up. And that really reflects climate change because it's a difference in climate that makes for the different vegetation zones. And as time goes by and the planet warms, then uh, those zones are going to be going uphill. And so we'll be able to watch that happen. The quality of the work that the students produce varies considerably. Some are very interested in doing a good job and others are not so interested. 
and on the teachers and how much we've inspired them to understand what we're doing. And of course, that'll make them do a better or worse job. Citizen scientists um, can produce very high quality work as long as they're trained and they understand why they're doing what they're doing. Um, in the case of our study, I think with each passing year, the quality of the work has gotten better and better because more and more kids understand why we're collecting this data. More and more kids have practiced collecting the data and more and more kids realize that they can actually collect this data and do it um, precisely. Let's study, we have started it to be a long-term study, so the idea is that we keep collecting the same data over a long period of time. The students will keep changing, but we'll be doing the same measurements from the same plots, and so we can watch the changes that happen in those plots over time. So hopefully it will continue the way it's been going, with some improvements, but always collecting very similar or the same data. So, LET is Local Elevation Transect Survey. We came up with the acronym in part because it makes complete sense and in part because it makes a great acronym like study. <laughs> so, local, it takes place locally, elevation, it's an altitude gradient. Transect is recording data along a line and then surveying, getting to know this, this area. And so it becomes LET study lays out. <clears throat> but it can be picked up by other places, as you'll see towards the end, to be let's study wherever your local um, school is, and let's study climate as the overall um, umbrella. And we'll do that as we go along here. So everybody these days knows about climate change and disappearing glaciers, and so there's plenty of examples we can show of, of that. <coughs> The Rhone Glacier that's the head of the Rhone Valley just down below us here during the Ice Age, of course, it filled all the way through Lake Geneva and beyond, but it's in just the last century and a half, it's been retreating up into the very headwaters and in just a few decades, it'll be gone completely. <clears throat> but our approach is through the lens of forest ecology, because as you go up the mountainside, you have all these different um, vegetation zones that are happening and life zones in general because there's animals that fit the vegetation that goes with it. And um, as things are warming, as the planet's warming, then some of these zones are being pushed right up and there's places where uh, species are just disappearing because they're being pushed off the top of, of mountains. And eventually that will happen here too, but there's a ways to go still. So when you look up from uh, here, you see uh, what looks like a tree line and it is a tree line, but it's not an absolutely precise tree line that happens. It's variable. You can see how it varies in that photo. But also, this is a tree that was in the upper part of that photo where it looks like there's no trees at all. But if you look closely, you'll find scattered little trees. And when we went up with students, we thought this was the, the top tree, the highest tree. But then um, Dan and I have found some trees that are even higher up on the hillside. And all this is going to be transforming over the, the next decades. This is from the um, Center for Alpine Ecosystem Research in Chamonix. And they're projecting, you can see the current altitude of tree line and going up a thousand meters just in the next few decades. So here we are, the valley bottom. Down there, it's deciduous, almost all deciduous. And um, warm enough to grow grapes, but you can see they, they stop. There's just a ring, ring of, of vineyards down below, and then that changes. Then you come up to the Lausanne elevation, just over a thousand meters higher, and you can see it's mixed forest, coniferous, deciduous, and then as you go up here, this is the ski lift just above here that um, if you're here on Sunday, you'll have a chance to go up if you want to. And uh, there it's just pure conifers and very patchy as you get up to the upper part. So we've put these plots that go all the way from the valley to the top of the mountain where we're researching 30 by 30 meter square plots. And we do this mostly during a couple of days during the school year, one in spring and one in fall. 
and we take the whole school out. Uh, well, it's in the fall, it's uh, seventh through 10th grade, and in um, May, it's just the 11th graders as part of their IB um, program. And so we go out, we put these strings out, and the strings mark the plots, so we make a grid out of it so that people can uh, study what's inside. It's a lot easier to map the trees, keep track of things, keep a photographic record. There's not going to be much change from one year to another, but from one decade to another, there might well be. And so here is doing a high, high plot up there. You see the strings and the intersection points. And uh, some years we do soil studies also in the plot, but so far we haven't been doing them every time because it, it rather disturbs the ground. And if we're studying inside these particular plots, we don't want to just be turning the whole thing over like a plow. We've also experimented with studying uh, meadows because there's actually a lot more interesting things that can be learned there too. They turn over a lot faster, but we haven't found the right system really for, um, for figuring those out. We're still working on it with a local ecologist. So it takes a huge amount of planning to get all the kids out there uh, to get uh, 120 or so, I think, from the lower school out at once, 12 different plots simultaneously. So we have to, uh, in advance, make sure we find the plots that we're going to use. And a lot of these we've done in consultation with the local forest ecologist. And we put together little guides for identifying species and these grid maps because we are not yet tagging the trees and most most plot studies where people follow forests they tag the trees we've decided instead to make a map mapping exercise out of it so we have this grid paper and the grids with that we lay out with the strings and the students map where the trees are in there it's or part of the the learning process too we use um, iNaturalist quite a bit, as you'll see a little bit later, and we measure the, look for the baby trees, because it takes a while for a big tree to change. That might be centuries. Um, don't know if the odds even have that much patience for this school. But, um, but the, to have a new species come in, it's going to start as a little one. So we have to watch out for those little ones, even though we're mostly measuring the bigger ones. We're looking at looking for these little ones to see when they arrive. And we have to make some of our own materials, like the strings. We wrap them around and spray paint every five meters so that we can identify where the grids are for laying out the plots. And then the day of, it's groups of 10 or so going out to 12 different places. It's, it's a real field day. But we are coming up with these protocols, and so far, all the protocols are on our internal you know, Google sites and uh, what's very convenient for us within the school, but it's not convenient for sharing outside the school because nobody from outside can get into it. So we've, we're starting to put uh, the protocols onto this WordPress site and um, copying them over so that anybody can actually um, follow what we're doing and repeat it, and we'll get to that a little bit more later, but this is part of our process. Training and curriculum integration is absolutely vital, and so far we're still at the budding stages of doing it right. We are, some teachers, like Dan in particular, spends quite a bit of time in it, in the class, and his class takes the students out, and they learn quite a bit in the field. Some of the other science teachers don't spend as much time in the field. Finding out just how to integrate it into the curriculum is something we're in the process of doing now. And one of our science teacher, Rachel, who's here, is, is helping to uh, write some curriculum that will integrate it more. And that'll be really vital for carrying this forward. And it does result in um, some real science. That's, that's the goal. Uh, we can chart some things like species and whether there's more of them higher or lower as we go up the mountainside, what the ratio of species is, and things like this. But, and we'll discuss all this more later, but we're still also in the infancy of managing our data properly. So far, we're putting it into Google Sheets, 
Yes? Yes, a question? Um, sure. <laughs> I, I mean, we're definitely going to do questions later, but it's whether we want to do it right now or we'll come back to it. But you'll remember it. Okay. So, yes, yeah, so happy to discuss. Everything's not as pretty as it, as it looks on the, this initial impression. And a lot of it's still a learning process for us, as I think it is for, for most people. Um, but so we're doing Google Sheets, which once again are not shareable. Um, and so we're wanting to develop the best place to put the data and systems like Python or whatever for analyzing it once we have accumulated enough data. And go back to our, our days when the students come back from the field, then we uh, have sort of a template on the right, the different things that have been collected, some pictures, and they make posters like this that are just hastily done when they come back that afternoon. We're looking to uh, potentially not rush it so much and maybe not try to do it that particular day, but to uh, follow up with more detail um, later on as one of the directions we're hoping to go. <coughs> and then we have our um, Globe Day uh, conference, which you'll see tomorrow. It was initially the gym was under construction or reconstruction, and so we were holding it up at this other building called uh, Belle Epoque, uh, that hopefully you'll see it's a spectacular building at the higher in the village. And that's where this is. So students presenting posters, sometimes on Let's Work, and we even took the um, <coughs> Let's Study poster produced by some students and had it at the EXA conference in Berlin in 2016. Um, and this, um, our head of science, Adam, um, put this together showing how it can all relate, how ideally it all feeds back on itself. The, the presentation day, the curriculum, teaching, um, the field project, that it all just um, is in this reinforcing loop. And that's our, our goal to just keep improving on this. So students, um, we always survey the students and they give us quite a number of um, reflections, you know, some appreciating that they're learning about climate change, but this is a very common one that you see down here where people say how incredibly hard it is. And it is hard because it's steep slopes. And I mean, there's just, it's hard to find a flat place here. And also we want our plots to be consistent. So we're not searching out you know, something that's different because it's flat. We want something that's consistent with the, the spirit of this place, which is not flat. Um, and so it's hard. They're not used to it. It's hard even for people who are used to it. But they very often come back saying it was an amazing experience anyway. There are those who don't, but um, a lot of them do. So we're always trying to think of ways to to grow it and measuring, I mean, to develop it so it's more fascinating to students and we're also doing more interesting things. Uh, there's only so many times students want to measure a tree, so but wildlife, so we're starting to put camera traps out and we've purchased a bunch of camera traps. Now we don't <coughs> put one at every one of our plots going up the mountain. And we have chamois around here. This is taken just over on the other side of the valley here but we have them all up and down the hillside um, here, including uh, they visit all of our plots and we capture them in our camera traps. So that's more uh, interesting to a lot of students, we suspect, than putting a tape measure around the tree. Uh, iNaturalist, I don't know if uh, all of you use it yet. It's an amazing tool and we're using that for our biodiversity. And you can see here, like Geneva on the far side, it's a big city by Swiss standards, and there's quite a cluster of observations from iNaturalist, but then you look over Les Ains here, and there's, we have a lot more than, than Geneva. <laughs> <laughs> and this is just, just behind us. We are right here, right now, and so this we call the Bolroy Bay Forest, that's just right behind, and we study it intensively. And so one of the uh, advantages of using iNaturalist is that you're not allowed to 
put humans on. But, um, this is one of our students. <laughs> but you have other people checking um, your observations. And you see the ones with green are research grade, and that means that two people have confirmed um, the species identification. And so that's really helpful. And so this was from not last fall, but the fall before, 900 and something observations. So what's next for LEPs? Um, we're not the only place with mountains. Does everybody recognize that mountain? Everest. That's Everest, yes. So um, Everest is obviously has a great elevation gradient. In this zone and up, there's not much life to study and there's no schools that high. But as you go down a bit, you start finding trees and down a little bit more, find villages that have schools. So this would be an example of a place, a school that could study its local elevation, um, its local vegetation and uh, biome. And they walk, the, the kids there, they just walk huge distances up and down, so it'd be pretty easy for them. I actually talked with the headmaster of the um, uh, the Hillary School up in uh, just above, um, just, this is Namchibarwa, so just above Kundu, I think, village. And he was very interested in the study. This is where I live in the States. My house is, is just down here, but we have volcanoes that go up to three and 4,000 meters. And there's schools um, right there in my village or town of Hood River, schools near each of these volcanoes. And so there's lots of places that can do this. And one of the things that really excited me, just this last year, the study came out about um, transect networks, making networks out of um, transect studies. And it, the paper goes into how incredibly cost efficient it is, but scientifically more valid it is when you put together a network of of transects, because any individual transect will have its local anom anomalies, it you know, won't be universal. But once you start putting together a network of studies, then it becomes very universal and very um, powerful scientifically. So this, to me, was just the perfect reinforcement for um, this idea of growing the study that we're doing here and bringing it to other schools because it actually becomes this network of schools that are cooperating and following similar protocols all around the world and making real science while teaching their students at the same time. And so we actually, uh, Dan and I, have put together a grant for uh, National Geographic and we're hoping that uh, we'll get that and if we do then that would spear or catalyze what we've been wanting to do anyway, and we do intend to pursue it, whether or not that particular grant comes through, but um, that's, that's where we're going with LEPs. So that's an overview of what we're doing here, and then I, you know, the rest of the time, the 10 minutes or whatever, um, questions very much. We have, there are plenty of things to ask us questions about, and you can start, Jeff. So my question was back um, maybe five or six slides, and I was just curious as to when you were um, having some of these plots, what you were fitting it to. So what was that? Um, oh, the curves? Yes. The regression curves? I don't remember what. That was in, uh, not Excel, but in Google Sheets. What, do you remember what kind of regression curve that was? I think it was just the direct, the right elevation on one, and then the... Uh, no, but the the, cur the uh, statistical. Oh, is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, I don't remember. No problem. And that is the sort of thing you know. We're um, in terms of the actual analysis of the data. That's one of the directions that we want to go is to involve the math department here quite a bit. And as we produce more. You know, enough data to be interesting, to make problem sets for them, then we're really wanting to make it much more um, cross-curricular. So math is a very obvious integration, but we're also wanting to connect 
the students with the environment and just having them go out and do some scientific measurements and come back, that's only a partial connection. Uh, if we have the art department involved and part of their day out is to um, draw or paint the scene that they that they have there or, and to write about it and to integrate the uh, cross-curricular activities, then it'll become much more powerful for them, um, much more of a learning experience for them. And so that's another example. So the math from the pure scientific side and then the art from this connecting the youth with nature side. Yes. Yeah, so that connects to my question is, uh, so they have this globe and net programs, but they also have the disciplines separated, uh, like additionally to this, or do all their co courses are um, connected to the globe or its program? Dan, why don't you start? <coughs> we would like it to be that way someday. Mm -hmm. but that's not the way it is now. Um, we're doing let's through science class. It's all happening in science classes, but as John said, there's just so many obvious connections to the yeah. other disciplines that that's definitely where we'd like to see this go. And what you'll see tomorrow, the GLOBE projects, is outside of all classes. It's a separate time period, so kind of nice in the sense that they don't come into it thinking they're coming into English or art or science. They're just coming in. They don't know what they're coming into because it's different. So it's, it's pretty interdisciplinary in that respect, but we're definitely hoping for more integration as time goes on. And from the geography and history side, yeah. it integrates so well and even connecting to the science because most of the Swiss landscape and where, where you find trees versus where you don't isn't just a natural thing, it's where they graze the cows or the goats or the sheep. And so they, it's very artificial, they actually subsidize alpine pasture farming up here with cows, in part to keep those beautiful meadows. Alp actually means meadow, it doesn't mean mountain. Uh, my question would be to your, your approach to planning these uh, kind of learning events. I mean, sometimes I, 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 in, in my, I've seen a lot of exams where you, like a scientist, you have a very interesting case and you think very spectacular cases. Mm -hmm. I need to teach the kids this, this, this experiment, which is sort of pragmatic approach where you say you have something and then you build in some kind of, you know, knowledge, skills, competences. That's the way we always are supposed to plan our mm -hmm. educational events, which is the other way around. I mean, my question is, do you guys go to it from the systematic uh, way of planning your, your learning events? I mean, that's the way it's supposed to be. You say, well, this is the learning goal, and, and, and this is the skills, not as well competences that the kids then need to have. And then you find some kind of case to, to, to use, or you go the other way around, which is what I see a lot of, and I, I do that myself sometimes. I say, well, I have a very spectacular experiment. I, I want to teach the kids, and then I work my way backwards and find, in a pragmatic way, the knowledge, the skills, and the competencies that I can build in, in, into that case that I already have. I know it's, a, <laughs> it's an irritating question. I mean, I, I, I normally, I mean, sometimes do it the wrong way, but I'm supposed to, to, to do it the, the, the right way, which is sometimes different. I don't, I don't know if there's necessarily a, a wrong way and a right way there, um, but I do know it's a constant reflection, reflective, experience. I mean, when we started, we were just trying to make it work. We just thought, how neat would it be if we could get the kids outside for a day? How neat would it be if we could get the kids doing something that simulates what real scientists do? Um, and it was all we could do just to make that happen. And then as the, as the year goes by and we see the way it works, we make adjustments. And now that we're in year three, we're starting to really come back around to what do we really want these kids to be learning and how can we use the experiences that they're getting throughout this experience to to learn those things how do we how do we highlight those things so i think we're kind of coming at it from several different directions at once but yeah and I, because we came out with this idea of something that we think is really cool which is to study this elevation transect but it it's a real headache 
compared to just going out and studying just around the campus grounds or something like that. It's a real nuisance and the students per se, do they get a extra, um, are they enriched by the fact that some of them go down low and some of them go up high? You know, they're not going, to, they're not visiting all the different plots because we can't send all the students to all the different plots, we have to split them up. So from that purely educational perspective, the student-centric perspective, it doesn't have to be the big thing that we're doing that has the whole elevation transect. But then you can't study um, what's interesting about being in the mountains and how things, the climate changes at these different elevations. So it's really trying to uh, match the, the two, the, uh, what the students get out of it and what science we can get out of it. I think that's a lot of citizen science is trying to match those two things, the scientific output and the, the user's um, engagement aspect. I think there's a lot of kind of soft skills that have kind of come out of this that we probably wouldn't have imagined three years ago if we were sitting down there trying to plan everything out that we want the kids to learn. We had to go out and kind of do it. And one of them is learning how to walk. I mean, you go out to the forest, the kids fall. And they fall, and it's a real learning experience because they realize what the edge of their ability is. And so the first time they fall, and the next time they, they're a little shaky, and then they're mountain goats running around okay. the forest. So it's like their learning is something as simple as how to put one foot in front of the other. Um, but then from the sci scientific point of view, also some soft skills in terms of, you know, why does it matter what the data looks like that we collect? Why does it matter if I write down five or if I write down six? It doesn't a lot of times in science class. And they don't learn that always unless they have something real they can reflect back on. So we, we look at this data. On the slides, it looked very clean. But in real life, the data looks very messy. And in some places, like one year, there'll be 40 trees. And the next year, there'll be 50 trees. But it'll be the same spot. And so the kids look at that and they say, what's going on? We, we can't do it. We can't count trees. There's no way, because we're too young. We can't, we can't figure out how to do this. But then we, we kind of talk about it more, and they realize, wait a second, we can count trees. We can do this. Um, and so they learn why it matters, why you pay attention to data, and why you, you, know, you have to write the number down clearly. Because maybe, maybe the kid counted the trees correctly, but he wrote a nine, and someone else thought it was a six. So those are the kind of like scientific soft skills that I think that's coming out of this. Well, and you saw in the, the movie, the girl who had the tape measure the circumference that was going at an angle yeah. like this. Um, we, it's too bad that's in the film. I might like to switch that out. Because <laughs> that, that can't be. That, that's an example of bad data collection. Well, I, I think can, it's I, can, I just, can I just oh. emphasize one thing uh, from, a, from a macro level? Experiential learning or project-based learning, as we all know in education, is, is something we all aspire to do as much as possible of. But Experiential learning, if it is not coupled with something meaningful and deep and impactful, you know, like giving the kids a sense that they can believe they're going to make a difference, just stays an academic exercise at the end of the day. I think that's what we're able to do there. Um, as much of a pain it is to get to that point. Yeah, I, th I think that, that, that kind of grows into the point I want to try and develop a bit, really, because that these, these extra skills are, 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 for me, what are kind of becoming essential life skills and, uh, you know, ob observation skills, working in teams and so on. Um, I'm sure that uh, Johanny and uh, Nick will have uh, their own experience to declare about Finland, but there's the, um, the Forestry Institute at Joensu uh, is doing similar uh, measurings of, of work um, around forestry. And, we, well, you know, there, there's, there's an international program around... Um, around that and of course Finland is also breaking down some of the curriculum boundaries and working through project-based activities. Um, but I, I, I'm very minded of a project we've just been doing in, in Nottingham, you know, an old industrial town with, with, with estates of urban deprivation and disadvantage and we, we take kids out into not, not the forest as such but into nature reserves that's close by at night. Um, over over three seasons, again m more than anything, just to help develop their observation skills, their listening skills, 
you know, the, in the forest after dark is a great is a great kind of experience for them. So again, it's very very experientially based, and we we work with an artist as well to kind of help develop some of their observation skills, and then how they can express what they've observed on that as well. So. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, would it be possible to extend the program to the kids, like uh, not only in high school but also? Oh. Yeah. I think so. I mean, we, that's a huge question in citizen science. Is like, what are they capable of? What, what is a regular citizen capable of? And maybe not everything we do, but you know, things like design naturalist is amazing. It's like all you have to know how to do is take a picture. You have to know how to take a close up and get the leaf and get the underside. But all you really have to do is know how to take a picture, and suddenly you're contributing and you're learning, and you're getting feedback, and it definitely seems like something someone younger can do. Um, but I, th I think also in the younger years, we have a lot less curricular pressure too. Um, so I think if you were to look at citizen projects, citizen science projects around the world that are, that are running, a lot of them are going in maybe not lower elementary school, but upper elementary school and middle school, and then at high school, and a lot of times they kind of go away because there's all these other pressures, the standardized tests, and then the curriculum, the very full curriculum, and it's, it's very hard to make citizen science work when you have all these other pressures too, so mm -hmm. that's a definitely important question moving forward. <clears throat> yes, in terms of involving um, younger people, it's something that we, like we have, for our, our particular study is an elevation transect. Um, study and that's what we're hoping to um, spread this network of that's around the world that we would like to figure out what are the best things to measure. It doesn't mean that everybody has to always measure the same thing. There should be an overlapping core set that people are doing around the world, but developing things that are appropriate for different age groups, for the public. Like right now, one of our flaws is that we go out in May, before much of the plant life has come out, and in October, after most of it, ha or a lot of it, has lost its leaves and died. So summer is the time to really be out there. But uh, the school does have a summer program, um, but it's not quite the same, and we're trying to figure out how to integrate uh, that. But maybe we can put our plots on the map and then talk with the local tourist board and make a sort of community project out of it so that citizens would go out there with the iNaturalist app, find our plots, and um, do some biodiversity studies while they're there. So that's something that they can do. They don't necessarily have to go out and measure the trees, but the tree's not going to change its measurement very much each year. Uh, but they can do biodiversity studies at different times of year that'll be actually very useful. And so we're always looking for ways to integrate like that. And the tea bag um, study that we've just started introducing part of this uh, Tea Time for Science program that unfortunately the person who was going to be talking to us about it from Austria wasn't able to come. But uh, we're now burying tea bags in the ground and then three months later over the summer, you dig them up and then you have red tea and green tea and you compare the decomposition rates and it tells you something about the soil. And then we're having the students in the fall put those tea bags in and then we'll dig them up in the spring um, just out of interest because we have the two groups going there. So it doesn't fit their program exactly, but we can still learn something about whether things decompose more in the winter down there than they do up in the mountains when they're covered in snow. So yeah, we're always looking for new things to add in that way. Yeah, when I was uh, uh, talking about kids, it was maybe to think of uh, intergenerational mm -hmm. teaching mm -hmm. and the younger, youngest, no, older, oldest will teach the youngest what mm -hmm. they have learned. Mm -hmm. And this is also a way to see if they have integrated what they have learned yeah. and have a peer-to-peer -peer learning. I think there's a lot of potential for that. Yeah, there are yeah, <laughs> so many things to do. <laughs> yeah. but, I'm really impressed with what you're doing. It's really cool. Thank you. Oh. Yes, um, I just wanted to find out what are your plans or visions in terms of getting the students involved in other stages of the citizen science project process. At the moment, they're involved in data collection, it seems. Mm -hmm. 
um, are you planning or are you involving them in an analysis of the data, writing it up anything further? And how do you see that fitting into the structure of the program in the future? It very much into our dream of how it should be. Okay. <laughs> and we are on our way, hopefully, and as one of the things that we're hoping to do with the curriculum integration would be instead of just having some lessons that lead up to um, Let's Day, and then you go out and then you make a quick little poster and then you're done with it, instead have it integrate within the series of weeks so then there is follow-up time when you can work with the data and you can um, write on it and you know, it's just a matter of kind of fit it into the, the curriculum structure, but um, definitely that's the direction we would like to go. But do the students understand that there's a bigger picture to it? Do they get that? We tell them, but okay. they understand that. <laughs> <laughs> we we, we Actually, take that too. We're working as, on that. Okay. <laughs> as the years go on, it becomes very interesting. <laughs> the first year, we didn't have anything. We, we didn't have anything to look at. Mm -hmm. And the next year, we had one year to look at. Now we have four years, well next year we'll have four years to look at, so they can start to really see these things like, why is the data variable? Like why, why does it vary so much from year to year? What's going on? They can start to be, start thinking about, well what was it like out there when we were out there? Where were the, the possible places that we might have made mistakes in the data collection? How do we make the protocols better? How do we make the training better? And so a big part of what I did this year is I asked the kids to really be critical of the study, like what should we do differently? Like. We, we can't be satisfied with data that's that variable. We have to get the variability, the variability down. So what are suggestions that you have? So I think that's, that's one way they're at least, they're starting to contribute to the way the study is designed. But it's also so much individual teacher to teacher. So Dan is super involved and super caring, other teachers less so. And so, but the school is wanting to have the the different classes take the same test at the end mm -hmm. of the year. Yeah. So if they've been with Dan versus with this other teacher who hasn't dwelled on this, then how can they take mm -hmm. the same test? Um, so there's those issues. And the more we integrate it nicely and have teacher buy-in, then um, the better it will be from, from the study's perspective, but also I think from the student's perspective. Okay. Uh, the students, how, for how long uh, they are involved in the activity? Only for one year or for more than one year? So, we're in our, this is our third year. And so, there's some students that have been doing it three years now. Some students that have been involved with this process for three years. Um, and another thing we really need to do is we need to figure out how to really differentiate the program so that a student that studies this in ninth grade, ninth grade is going out and collecting the same study or the same data the next year, but they're learning a different aspect of it so that they're not just repeating, repeating the same things year after year. But at the same time, there's certain things they kind of need to repeat because until you do something a couple of times, it's hard to kind of understand what you're doing. So we have to find the right balance between getting the re repetition in there so by the time that they graduate, they really understand what forest ecology is but also varying it so that they feel like they're learning something different every year. It's, it's a bit of a challenge that we're working on. Can I just this jump is, in yes. there? Just to add to what this lady was asking about the data analysis, and also what you just asked about how often they get involved. Up at Bellapot, we teach the International Baccalaureate. Um, and so this last year, we did our Group 4 project on the LET study. Um, <laughs> Um, so we did the group four project on the LET study and we looked at uncertainty in the data. So that was something they addressed and that was with the um, classes, class 11. 11, yeah. So um, we're kind of, as the transects moving up and down, we're moving up <laughs> and taking it up with us to Bellapock. So that's the idea. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of different levels you can look at, a lot of different sophistication levels you can look at this on from, you know, just drawing a map on a grid paper, which might be amazing for a seventh grader, to doing regression analysis up in 11th and 12th grade. There's a lot of different kind of insertion points into this kind of study, so we have to kind of identify those and develop a, a curriculum that kind of flows from year to year.